get a Nehemiah 13, our final study, where we're going to focus on remember me. We'll see why that is significant. But thinking of remembering, I guess we're naturally drawn to grave markers, tombstones, because usually there are words of remembrance on them. What was most important to the deceased that they wanted listed there? And there are great things like asleep in Jesus. I think that's what's on my parents' gravestone. Awaiting the resurrection. Those are all great phrases to have there. But some famous comedians opted for less serious epitaphs. And I thought I might share a few of them with you this morning. So we've got some pictures of them, just so you know. We're not making this stuff up. So Merv Griffin, familiar name to most people, game show host. So he decided to put the phrase on his, I will not be back after this message. <laughs> Next one, Mel Blank. Probably not a familiar name to the younger generation, but some of us who are older remember he was the famous voice of Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd, Daffy Duck and Porky Pig. In fact, he was called the man of a thousand voices. If you can read it, he had on his, that's all folks. I think it was supposed to be, the, 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 that's all folks, but I guess you can't quite word it that way. So some less famous people had less than serious epitaphs on theirs. I like this one. I was hoping for a pyramid. <laughs> Doesn't look like one to me. Here's one. Raised four beautiful daughters with only one bathroom and still there was love. <laughs> that could have been my father-in-law's. <laughs> And in this one, I've heard it before. I hadn't heard this second part. I told you I was sick. Apparently, that was the wife. On the other side, the husband's final words was, and I was sick of hearing it. <laughs> Ooh. And they're buried side by side, apparently. So anyway, that's how some people have chosen to be remembered. Nehemiah, four different times. This is unique to the book of Nehemiah. Four different times in the book of Nehemiah, he asked God to remember him. I might also add there were two times he asked God to remember his enemies. And you might imagine he didn't ask God to remember the enemies very favorably. But four different times, Nehemiah is asking of God in prayer that he might be remembered. Back in chapter 5, verse 19, is the first listing of how he wanted to be remembered. He said, Remember me favorably, my God, for all that I have done for this people. Now, in chapter 13, three different times he speaks about being remembered. We'll go ahead and mention those as we look into it. Verse 14 he says, remember me for this, my God, and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of my God and for its services. Verse 22. He says, remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion in keeping with your abundant faithful love. And finally, the very last part of the last verse, verse 31. Remember me, my God, with favor. A humble man of God who's asking of God that he might remember him with favor. So we remember Nehemiah largely because we have a book that bears his name. And we're indebted that this has been inspired and preserved and so we remember Nehemiah because of this book, but there are a lot of things about him that we remember and we greatly appreciate about Nehemiah. The first thing that has stood out to me that I appreciate so much about him was that he was a man of prayer, a deep man of prayer, fervent prayer, persistent prayer. He prayed for months on end, faithfully seeking out God. So we remember him as a man of prayer. We remember him 
as a man who had a great passion for the work and the will of God. He so much wanted the welfare of Jerusalem and its citizens, the city of God, the people of God. We remember him as being a hardworking and a humble man. He had a pretty cushy position as cupbearer to the king, a very high, exalted position, very important position. But we sense his humility, his dedication to the work of God, in that he was willing to trade that job for a period of time and put on a construction hard hat, so to speak, and go to Jerusalem and work side by side, working equally hard with those workers who rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. So we see him and appreciate him as a hardworking and a humble man. We see him as a great leader because he was very decisive. We see a lot about his leadership in this last chapter. So we recognize him as an outstanding leader and a great example to each one of us. So I want to jump to verse 6 here in chapter 13. It's a very important verse to preface what we read in this chapter this morning. Verse 6, Nehemiah speaking first hand. And he says, but during all of this time, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king. After some time, however, I asked leave from the king. So Nehemiah had gone and helped to rebuild the wall. And then he went back to his job, and apparently there was some news that he heard about things going on back in Jerusalem. And he felt there was an urgency for him to go back and attend to some situations which we are going to take a look at here in this chapter this morning. So one of the things that we remember about Nehemiah is that he was uncompromising concerning the enemies of God. And I want you to notice that out of verses 4 to 9. So it says, now prior to this, Eliashib the priest... Boy, I just love the names in Nehemiah. I've had more trouble with Nehemiah. I think I got that one right. Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him where formerly they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priest. Again, but during this time, he says he was not in Jerusalem. Verse 7, And I came to Jerusalem, and I learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. It was very displeasing to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. And then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms. And I returned there the utensils of the house of God, the grain offerings, and the frankincense. Does that name Tobiah ring a bell? It ought to, because we've read about him and two other individuals quite a bit in Nehemiah as decisive enemies against God and against the work of God. Nehemiah had more trouble with those three men than anyone. They were bent on stopping the work. And so Tobiah figures rather prominently in all of that. Notice what we just read. So this enemy of God actually was brought in to the very house of God. And there was a room that was reserved for all the supplies for worship and so forth. And all those got moved out by the high priest. Which, by the way, I think it mentions that the high priest was related to Tobiah. So here's a relative who's done this horrible thing to clear out all the, the elements for worship in the temple, cleared all of that out, and basically created a guest room for Tobiah, who had so fiercely opposed Nehemiah. So literally, the enemy was invited within. What a horrible thing. So we see Nehemiah's uncompromising leadership in the situation. I love verses 8 and 9. Nehemiah personally came in, I can just about picture this, personally came in and threw everything out, I imagine in a fit of rage. He cleared everything out, and not only that, as a governor, as an official over them, he gave an order that they should cleanse the rooms and they should reinstate that room for what it was designed to be used for in the temple. So there again, we appreciate Nehemiah as being uncompromising 
with the enemies of God. We also remember Nehemiah as being uncompromising concerning responsibility, because if you follow with me down in verse 10, down to verse 14, he says, I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. So I reprimanded the officials, and I said, why is the house of God forsaken? Then I gathered them together and restored them to their post. All Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. So in charge of the storehouses, I appointed, and I'll just tell you certain individuals, whose names I will not pronounce, that were considered reliable, and it was their task to distribute to their kinsmen. Remember me for this, O God. Do not blot my loyal deeds, which I have performed for the house of my God and its services. So the scenario here, the situation is the priest and the musicians, and, and they were literally hired workers for the service of God's temple. Apparently, after Nehemiah left and went back to serve the king, they decided to stop issuing paychecks. So the payroll department decided to cut them off. And so this was greatly displeasing to Nehemiah. So these people who were being paid, and rightly so, according to the law of God, for the service of the temple, well, they had to come up with some way to make a living. So they go back in the countryside, go back to their fields, and they earn a living doing that. But they had been hired for the service of God's temple. And so Nehemiah was greatly disturbed concerning that. In fact, it says that he reprimanded those that were responsible. That's a very strong word, apparently, in the original language. It means he contended with, made a loud noise. So I guess that means there was a lot of shouting that went on. So when Nehemiah reprimanded them, he raised his voice. He was very alarmed, very angry about this horrible disservice that had taken place. So we see a decisiveness where he set a wrong right. Another thing that we remember concerning Nehemiah, and I keep using the word uncompromising, but indeed he was, he was uncompromising with God's word. As you look in verses 15 to 22, he says, in those days I saw in Judah some who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads. And they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I admonished them on the day they sold food. Also men of Tyre were living there who imported fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. And then I reprimanded, there's that word again, then I reprimanded the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing you were doing by profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do the same? So that our God brought on us and on this city all this trouble, yet you were adding to the wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Is that as far as I was going to? I was going to read down further, I guess, down to verse 22. And so once or twice the traders and the merchants of every kind of merchandise spent the night outside Jerusalem. And then I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, I will use force against you. And from that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come as gatekeepers to sanctify the Sabbath day. For this also, remember me, O oh my God, and have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loving kindness. So we get the idea that the Sabbath law of God was being violated. The thing that makes that very, very serious was a solemn vow that the people had previously made. If you go back to chapter 10 and look in one verse, verse 31, chapter 10, verse 31. And the thing about chapter 10 was the people had made on an occasion a solemn vow and, and put it in writing and signed their names to it. So what we see in verse 31 is a part of what they had on, on a document a vow that they had made to God, and it says, verse 31, As for the peoples of the land who bring wares of any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath, 
or a holy day, and we will forego the crops the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. You see the problem? They made a solemn promise to God about this very thing they were doing. They put it in writing. They signed their names to it. And here now, in short order, they went back on the vow that they had made. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, God's law says that when a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to put himself under an obligation, he must not break his word. He must do whatever he has promised. I believe that's the real problem here. The Sabbath may be not so much as the vow they made concerning it. They had gone against the very promise they had made to God. Making a vow is a pretty serious matter to God. If you promise God something, you better follow through on it. So I believe the real issue that Nehemiah addresses here was the vow, which was much more serious than the Sabbath. And I say that because reading in the Gospels, we see Jesus was rather unconventional concerning the Sabbath. So is this thing really about the Sabbath or the vow that was made? Jesus had a habit which got him into a lot of trouble of doing work on the Sabbath, the very thing that's spoken about here in Nehemiah. He had a habit of healing the sick, the injured, and so forth on the Sabbath. I've often read the Gospels and thought, boy, Jesus could have saved himself a lot of trouble if he had just picked another day. You know, meet me tomorrow morning and I'll heal you. He deliberately picked the Sabbath day to make a point. There's an account in the Gospels of his disciples on a Sabbath day going through a field, picking grain, which was strictly forbidden according to the law. Matthew chapter 12, you don't need to turn there, but I would encourage you to take note of it and study if you want a perspective on this Sabbath concerning Jesus. Matthew 12, verses 2 to 8, very important message concerning Jesus' perspective of the Sabbath, summarized very well in two verses that I share out of Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, where he said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I share those things because we read this passage of Nehemiah, and it's very easy to get into this Sabbath law-keeping kind of a thing. Pretty important to realize the problem here was the vow, the promise, not so much the Sabbath, because we're under the lordship of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, and that's a pretty important perspective for, for each of us. So I felt it was pretty important to bring that in. Having said that, another thing we notice about Nehemiah being uncompromising was concerning marriage and family. Verses 23 to the end of this chapter address that situation. Verses 23 and 24 especially summarize the issue of marriage and family that Nehemiah addressed. He says, In those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And as for their children, notice this, half spoke the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. So there was this intermarriage issue, and children are being born that don't understand the language of Judah. And that's a pretty serious issue, because to not understand the language of Judah is to not understand the word of God. So you see what's happening with these compromising marriage situations. The children are not being brought up in, in the Word of God, the law of God. And so the next generation is going to miss out on the priorities of God, which is a pretty serious matter. God wants each generation to learn His Word and His will, and the responsibility falls to the parents so if you've got children that don't even understand the language of the Word of God, what a problem that is. I think about Deuteronomy 6. What a great, important passage. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. Probably familiar to most of us here. But these are such important words. Hear, O Israel. Pay attention, Israel. The Lord Yahweh is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And this is especially important in light of what we read in Nehemiah. You shall teach them diligently. 
to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as, sign, as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. We get the idea of the great passion of God being communicated through Moses. Know this great truth about who your God is. He is one. Make this a priority that you teach your children. That's what Nehemiah is incensed about is how can you teach the children if they don't understand the language of the word of God? You're defeated already. The next generation will lose. Boy, I, I think there's a great parallel in this day and age. It's so important for the current generation to be taught of their parents to know the word of God, to know the will of God. And the thing that we note is that responsibility falls not to a synagogue, not to a Sunday school, not to a church. They can help. It falls to the parents. Again, Nehemiah is incensed because the parents are missing out. The next generation is to be lost concerning that. I want you to notice in this, there's a response that we see of Nehemiah. Again, we see his leadership, but maybe in some unorthodox ways. Verses 25 and 26, which is a little bit reminiscent of something we see with Jesus when he uh, cleansed the temple in a, in a fit of rage. So verse 25, Nehemiah says his own words, I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, you shall not give your daughters to their sons nor take of their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the nation, many nations, there was no king like him. And he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. Again, Nehemiah is so concerned with the passing along with the faith. And we certainly see some leadership that Nehemiah exerts here, that he's reprimanding them. I don't guess that, that word is used there, but in essence, he's reprimanding, even cursing them, pulling out their hair. Obviously, he's in a fit of rage, righteous indignation over a wrong concerning the things of God. So again, he felt so strongly that he asked God to remember the wickedness of the enemies in verse 29. I guess we need not read that, but remember them. Remember those who have opposed you, God, and opposed your will. And then, again, we come to those concluding words, the last part of verse 31. Remember me, O God, for good. Remember me for good. Something about that phrase tugs at my heart. I'm thinking, you know, I feel like Nehemiah. I want to be remembered for good as well. God, when you sum up my life, I want you to remember me for good. I want you to remember me for good that I have done for God's people, as he said here. Remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion in keeping with your abundant, faithful love. That speaks to me as well. Do you know the thing that occurs to me is that we need not doubt how God will remember us. And that's because of what we do in remembrance. It is appropriate we do that this day, what we call Communion Sunday. As I think about Nehemiah asking to be remembered, I think about Jesus speaking about remembrance in Luke 22, verse 19, when it says, at the Last Supper, he had taken some bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Nehemiah says, God, remember me with favor. Jesus says, remember me in what I have done for you. And so if we remember what Christ has done for us, we can know that God remembers us with grace and forgiveness if, this is important, if we belong to Christ. I add that's a very, very big if. God will not remember us with favor if we do not belong to Christ. 
But boy, if we belong to Christ, God remembers us with favor, as Nehemiah asked. I like Romans 8.1, a verse to take to heart. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not those who know something about Jesus, but those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in him, there is no condemnation. To be in him, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 tell us that you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's how you meet that condition of if for God to remember you with favor. So remember me for good. God remembers us for good if we are in Christ. It's important to think about being remembered. When all is said and done, when we come to the end of our days, and we all will, when we come to that day when we draw our last breath, I can tell you the only thing that's going to matter on that day is how God is going to remember us and how God remembers us at that point. Because when we have drawn our last breath, nothing further can be done to change how God remembers us. It's all said and done at that point. So it's a pretty important question to ask while we have life and breath. Does God have a good memory of me today? Right now at this moment, thinking about what Nehemiah asked, does God remember me? Does God remember you for good? Or will God be thinking as he remembers your life? Well, he or she was pretty good about going to church regularly on Sunday mornings. He or she did a lot of good deeds to help out people that were in need. He or she was very friendly to others and pleasant toward others, lived as a good citizen in the land. Sadly, they never made a decisive decision in faith to accept Jesus Christ, followed up with baptism. If they had only done that, if I can put God's words to you this morning, if only they had done that, I could have remembered them for good, for the goodness of my son Jesus. And I think that's pretty accurate as to how it goes in terms of how God remembers. We dare not assume that we are good enough for God to remember us with favor of our own. Romans 3.12, I know you're familiar with that, that no one does good, not even one. So no, no matter how religious and faithful we might seem to be of our own, on our own, none of us are good, not a single one of us. Again, if God would remember us for good, as Nehemiah asked, it is only through the goodness of his son. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. The one who has the son has life. The one who doesn't have the son of God does not have life. It's one or it's the other. If God would remember us for good, it will only be remembering us through Jesus Christ. I share those things because I want you to make absolutely certain this day that God is remembering you for good because you belong to his son. If you know that you don't belong to his son, seal that deal today. This is the day that can be taken care of.